Gig Gab, episode 436 for Monday, July 1st, International Creative Ice Cream Flavors Day. It's also International Reggae Day 2024. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab. We are the show about working musicians. Our sponsor this week is factormeals.com slash gig gab five zero. That's where you're going to use code gig gab five zero to save 50% off factors. They're fantastic. These ready to eat meal kits. I use them all the time, especially before gig. Anyway, I'll talk about that in a little bit for now. And, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. And. We'll hear what ChatGPT makes me say because I've been having ChatGPT write all my ad scripts because it keeps it interesting for me and keeps it fun for all of you. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And uh, as as a returning guest co-host today, folks, we have the one, the only, and recording on his birthday, Mike Schulte. Thanks, Mike, for coming on board. I think this is uh, four or five that I've been on now since uh, since Paul left. Maybe four or five. Oh, let's is this look. Three, four, maybe. Let's see. So th- one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh. You've been on the show six times, but one of them, I think, the first one was with Paul. Oh, yes, you're right. It was. We did we did one with Paul. There you go. Correct. Correct. So. Yeah, I think yeah. that's uh, I think I've been on cover band confidential maybe five to six times as well. So I think we've got a little war going on here. Like who who can Mike Schulte be the top of, you know, like oh. I want to guess the most. On right, just come on next shows. week. We'll fix this. There you it's go. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love having you. Uh, this is this is great. This feels it that we're comfortable now. We know what we're doing. It's it's all good. And and listeners seem to love it. The uh, I, yeah, are you getting? Fe- I I always feel yeah. like I'm I always feel like I'm a turd and I I say the wrong things and I'm I'm too edgy sometimes. So I I think oh, there is good. probably a contingent of people that are like, ah, oh, Mike Schulte, God, I don't want to talk Skip. to him anymore. But that's right. Yep. I do yep. think there is, and actually, like, we'll I'm sure we'll get into it. But I've been I've been reprocessing quite a bit of my mentality of uh, of you know who i am and I, i'm i'm so old now and and i have a a second child that will be born in five weeks and i'm just sort of reprocessing like my purpose in life and and my mentality about things and and so i maybe this is a new mike schulte maybe you're going to hear a different version of me today uh, we'll find out this is the this is the birthday mike schulte uh uh retrospective reflective version of mike schulte it very much is. You're gonna get. You're gonna get a special one today. I can tell you. <laughs> All right, that's fine. I I was thinking. You know, you play in, in, as I put together the show notes here. Of course, I I put it. it you know, your guest co-host Mike Schulte from Pork Tornadoes and Confused Breakfast. And right above that is when I go through the date thing and figure out what you know the date, the release date of the show. What like what's the date? And it's it's International Creative Ice Cream Flavors Day. And so when you combine those two things. I have a very creative breakfast idea or a confused breakfast idea, perhaps uh, be, with with an ice cream flavor of pork and tomatoes. That's what my brain saw was pork and tomato ice cream. So I don't like go. that at all. That sounds See, terrible. That sounds awful. I'll I, try. I, I'll try anything once, but, but I don't think I'm going to like it. But here's the thing, though. Like it's pork and tomatoes. Would you eat pork and tomatoes uh, if it was served to you as a dinner? Right. Yeah. Yeah. BLT like bacon and tomatoes is quite tasty. Right. You're right there. And and might you put cheese on on that or, like, or have or mayonnaise, you know, like you or, got a bit of a dairy kind of a thought in that Well, mayonnaise isn't dairy. But well, we're going to uh, pretend but like that's just is. nitpicking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's creamy ish like the mayonnaise yeah. is. Yep. And so the creamy with the pork and the tomatoes kind of goes OK until we make it sugary cream, isn't it? Yep. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's where it that, gets that's gross. That's the problem I have. Yep. <laughs> that's the major issue. All right. So sugary cream, bad. That's that's it. OK. Yep. Yeah. I don't. I For example, I don't think that would be a meal factor would make at all. No, yeah. no, 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 uh, I, uh, I, I had I had two gigs rained out this past weekend, <laughs> which <laughs> which sucked. Because one of them was a gig with my friend's country band, uh, 
and I talked about this with Adam Johnson from Cover Band Confidential yeah. last week. Good episode. Learning, you know, he, thank you. Uh, it, you know, it's modern country. So I had to learn all of the songs. I didn't have any of them like pre-learned. I knew some of them, but with country, you can't just trust that you're going to four, four your way through it. Cause you don't know where those little hiccups and stops are. So I had to learn all these tunes an hour away from the gig, uh, in the car, phone rings, and <laughs> my buddy's like, we're cursed. <laughs> so You're like, like, thank God. God. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I was, by that yeah. point, I was in. If he had called me the day before, yeah. I would have been like, whoo, thank goodness. But by that point, I'm like, well, this is going to happen, so I, I just got to be mentally ready to be like, it's, so, it's weird being, uh, uh, how often do you get to sub on gigs? You know, I used to a lot. I used okay, to great. sub so much, and it was awesome. Like, there was a period of my life where when I was getting into real estate, you know, paychecks are not coming in your first couple years of, of trying to be a real estate agent. And uh, so I played uh, one year, I played, like, 90 shows with, like, 10 different bands. Uh, okay. And, and and I became kind of the guy you call at that point. Uh, I, de- I 100% do, I refuse to sit in and sub anymore. I'm too busy to do anything like that. And, and generally speaking, uh, you know, I don't think you can afford me, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but for me to take a date off of my calendar for the pork tornadoes, you, you're going to owe me some money, you know, to, to right. make up for the potential of a pork tornado show coming in. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. And I, 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 I used to do a lot of subbing and then I got out of it like you did. I, my schedule got too packed and, and, and it just wasn't like people would call me for a little while. Oh, yeah. And then they stopped calling me because Same. my answer was always no, you know, but lately, as I mentioned, you know, I, I kind of found that when I, when I didn't put my drums in my car for five months, it was like, all right, I got to like put the feelers out. And, and it was like, well, the phone stopped ringing. Did it stop ringing because I'm a jackass or did it stop ringing? Cause I always said no. It turns out it was because I said, no, it doesn't change the fact that I'm a jackass. People just still are willing to call me. Uh, well, when you're good, when you're good, like you are, and I feel like I am about, um, your, your online persona of like, I'm doing all these things. Look at all these things I'm doing. I think that's a good thing because it shows people what you're doing and it shows you that you're busy, but it, it also puts the mentality in people's brain that you're too busy because uh, you're doing your job. You're getting the content out there. You're like, wow, I did this podcast. And I did this other podcast and I did this band and I played with this band because you're doing what you're supposed to do. Get yes. the word out. But people can view that as you being too busy. I've had the phone not ring before for many aspects of my life because people are like oh you're you're too busy for that i'm like no i'm no uh, i'm not you can call me I'm, I'm available <laughs> yeah, please make the phone ring that's how yes. i stay productive and i don't like the word busy but i like productive yes productive. Uh, how i keep my schedule full right but yeah but yeah absolutely so but you know the subbing thing especially as a drummer i mean this is true of any position in a band but i feel like if you've got uh drummer who is not playing with confidence it like that's bad and 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 i know it's bad if a singer is singing without confidence bad even if a guitar player is playing without confidence but it's i don't think it's the same if you've got a timid guitar player and the and the drummer is still and the bass player and the singer is still driving things home that's different than if you've got a confident everybody and a timid drummer because they don't know the songs and so subbing as a drummer is always a really interesting thing because like I had to get into that mindset as I got in the car driving down of like, I don't, it doesn't matter how scared I am of screwing up at this gig. I'm definitely going to screw some things up. Like, you know, that going in, you hope it doesn't happen, but I have to put it in my head that it's going to happen so that when it does it, like I can just set it aside and be like, okay, we got that out of the way. Now let's like stay confident state. Cause if you get shaken, man, it's bad. The it's whole band true. suffers. I think it's very true. I, I I'm a proponent of, especially when you're talking about drums, that that I I've been playing drums for thirty something years now, and like I will never be the best drummer. Like I will never. It's my time has passed. I didn't. I have not practiced enough, nor will I ever practice enough. I will never sure. be the guy. I'm I'm an average drummer. You know, there are so many drummers better than me, but where I can make myself 
the the person that deserves the throne. I've had a lot of a, a drunken drummers tell me before or tell Pork Tornadoes members be like, be like, ah, oh, you know, I should, I'm better than that Mike guy. I should, I should play with you. And all of the band members' responses are like, you couldn't hack it. You know, you you're not you're not confident enough. You can't stay with the click. You can't lock in with us and let the rest of the band shine. And so I I'm a huge proponent if a young drummer's asking me how to get the gig, like do everything else like the talent is pr- pretty much the last thing on the on the I mean, menu that people I think care there's about. A, a minimum amount of talent yes you need. i mean you're but, you're if you're being considered for the job you're you're a good drummer right but correct the correct. fact that you can you can play polyrhythms does not matter right if you can if you're playing in a in a modern country band that your your ability to hang your ability to lock in and to like know when to when to go up and down in your dynamics and the confidence that you said that is where that is where no one will no one will touch me in that aspect. But your talent levels are way better than me. I guarantee yep. it. But but I, I had a co- a comment from our bass player. We used to fight so much. He I come from the '90s, right? Like I'm learning how to play drums to '90s rock and roll by listening to it. And, okay. And All if right. you and if you go back and listen to '90s rock and roll grunge, those drummers are just so lazy let's just put it this way they're they're so behind the beat in everything that they do where it's almost hard to listen to if you go back on it uh and my my bass player would be like come on like come on get on the get on the click i'm like i am on the click i'm here what are you talking about and we would have arguments like on stage with each other about like you're not doing what you should be and i'm like yes i am and and i finally have figured it out i finally understood Cause I was never taught, you know, I, I finally understood that there is a difference about being in front of the beat and behind the, the whole beat, beat and, placement thing is, is fascinating to learn. And no one ever taught me that. And, and of course, if I learned by em- emulating all these drummers that were being lazy, uh, then, then and that's lazy just, is the wrong, lazy yeah. is the wrong word. I, I know why you're using that word, but, but it, they're not lazy. It's that they're playing behind the beat. Like that's where that pocket sits for them. Yes. you got a lot of new Orleans drummers playing behind the beat. Yeah. Country bands. Oh yeah. Way in front of the beat. Right. Oh, and like way in front, <laughs> way in front of the beat. I noticed playing in a blues band that the either, and it's usually the drummer has to be right on the beat. And the bass player plays behind it, and that creates that big fat pocket, right? But if both people are playing behind it in a blues band, it doesn't work as well. Yeah. It can be the bass player driving it. I played one night with this guy. He sat in, this guy, Larry Lange. He's passed away since. He was um, Delbert McClinton, I think. Uh, it might have been his bass player's. No. Uh, yeah, it might have been McClinton's. Anyway, he talented guy, right? He just happened to show up on Sixth Street in Austin one night, and the the, the guys in the band knew him because they played with him in Lubbock a hundred years before or whatever. And so he gets on the stage and grabs the bass, and it's just a trio. So it's me and the guitar player, who's the singer, and and Larry, and uh, and we played tore down Clapton's, you know, but don't and we started that tune, and he was like way up on top of the beat and driving the bus and it was yep. like oh this yep. is how this is supposed to be got it and not you, that there was anything wrong with it our unless bass player. you hear it yeah like when you yeah. hear it you go oh <laughs> there it is <laughs> oh and then it was like ah i need to not drive him i need to let him drive and i'll play a little behind and then as soon as i did that by like the second verse the dance floor just filled up and it was yep. like uh, and he looked at me and gave and gave me a nod, and he was like, "That's right, you know." And, it was, and I, I, I really want to know what he was thinking during the first verse because <laughs> I'm sure he was like, "What is this guy doing?" Okay, there he is. Got Ooh, it. Oh, got it. Got it. But and it's your ability to under your ability to understand that is such an important skill, and I and I think those are the things that that these young uh, musicians need to learn, like those kind of skills, the the unteachable skills in a way of like just doing it and and understanding it and being around people that are like no hold on listen listen to this listen to this and and i i owe it to my bass player for that and he told me the other day it kind of all paid off whatever 12 years later he's like hey man i could never play with another drummer for the rest of my life oh there you go he's like he's like i've done it recently and i can't (laughs) i hate it (laughs) he's like i have to play with you forever i'm like all right cool man i did my job yeah yeah you can't yes job security that's right (laughs) (laughs) so like how I I feel like these things are difficult to teach, but they are learnable. I mean, we, we've at least you and I have 
we are aware that they are things that we need to know. And at some level, we've learned some parts of it. I, I, I certainly don't. Uh, oh, yeah. Profess to being a master of, of no. beat placement or anything. <laughs> but I'm at least aware of it as a concept. And the way I like to think of it, just for the benefit of listeners, and this isn't just for drummers. I think everybody, it, the band is better off when everyone understands that beat, beat placement. Like I said with Larry, you know, he came on stage and he was playing ahead of the beat. And so I had to play behind it to to create that pocket. Yep. And and it, and he didn't join me behind the beat. He stayed where he was. He stayed home. And that's what created that pocket. And so in an effort to begin to teach this, I as I started to become aware of it and was trying to think about like, okay, well, I mean, the time doesn't change. The tempo doesn't change. Yeah, correct. You don't, yeah. you don't want the tempo to speed up or slow down no. depending on whether you're ahead, behind, or right on the beat. So I started thinking of each beat as a, as a, as a circle and there's like the middle of it. And then it's like, like okay, well, yeah, but where am I placing? Yeah. And so, and a lot of times as a drummer, I'll place the kick drum on the beat and the snare a little behind. Okay. That's right? kind of how I play. My snare is generally lags a little bit, you know? Yeah, Exactly. It, how do you think of it in your head? I mean, it, like to, like I said, to me, I see a circle and I play in different spots of the circle, but the circle moves around at hopefully the same tempo, you know, the whole, the whole song. I don't think about it visually. I, I think yeah. about it more the way I hear it. And, you know, like our entire show is to click track. So so I will find I will find myself listening to the click and then seeing if I can make it disappear. You know, like so if yes. I make the click disappear. To where you're wondering, is the click still playing? That means you are spot right on the click. You are Absolutely. on the beat. And then I'll try to slowly move it. I'll try to be like, no, 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 push it a little forward to where we yeah. can hear it again. And then I'll try to lag a little bit and see if it goes away and then it comes back again. And I'll play that game a little bit just to see just to see what feels right kind of in the yes. songs. But generally the stuff we play is is very up tempo and you know and it's very like get on top of that and that's where that's where the van wants me to be so i will at least be on it or pushing it if i can or but pushing. I, I like to hear it audibly a little bit you know that's it's smart and i mean the fact that you're doing that on stage <laughs> communicates <laughs> that there is plenty of confidence in you because that's a scary thing if you if you don't have the confidence with the click you like it it it's this is definitely something that I would advise folks to do in the practice room first alone and then in the rehearsal room with the band before you start <laughs> doing this on stage. But you will find that moment where it it shifts, right? Where the click, instead of becoming this thing, there was a conversation online where it was having somebody, it was probably in Cover Band Confidential or, or Cover Band Central, Central or some, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, it, you know, people are like, oh, I'm there, there was there was comments about people that effectively were afraid of the click. They're like, oh, it's like it's you know, I don't I, it's it's always a chore playing with the click. Maybe that's the right way to say it. I don't want to Im imply fear, but it's like, oh, OK, you just aren't you, you haven't learned how to do this yet because it and I remember my first time with the click. I didn't know how to do it either. And it it absolutely uh, embarrassed and and humbled me. Um and that was fine. Like these, sometimes these are teachable moments. It was actually with my teacher. He set the click going and told me to play whole notes. And I was like, oh, dude, I know how to do this. He's like, yeah, just do it to the click. And I couldn't. Uh, and so that set me on a path for decades to learn how to do this. But now, like in the studio, I like the click because it means I don't have to worry about keeping time. That's the click's job. I can worry about playing where my beat placement is, all this, and I know the clicks right there, and it's totally okay. And I, I, you know, I mean, sometimes you get so far off it, you you can't get back on. It, it doesn't happen as much anymore as it used to, but yep. it still happens sometimes. You I know? think it's, it's like, so important. You know. I think the click's so important because uh, I've been doing it for so long now that, I mean, our entire show is choreographed to making sure that we're where we need to be. And, and that's the videos playing and the lights are going off and, right. and the smoke and the, and the cold sparks, they all go off at right at the correct times, as long as you're where you need to be. So I just, be, it became a thing where I had, I had to do it and I prefer it. I, it's to the point where if you 
were to say, Hey man, let's just, let's just jam something. Like I'll second guess myself the whole song being like, am I, is this the right tempo? Are we dragging? Oh. Like, what are we doing? Where, where the click is just a thing to make sure we're not, we're not here for ourselves. Like, yeah, would it be cooler to not have to play to this? Of course. But we want to make sure the show is good for the people out there, the people that paid money to see it and, and us rushing through a song because we think we're in the right tempo is not what's best for them. And, 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 you know, like we've all been there where you think you're starting the song. You're like, okay, here it is. Yeah. But your adrenaline is flowing so hard that you are not, you are, you are, you wanted to be at 120. you're at 140, and you think you're at 120. And those are, those are things that I'm sure drummers that, that, have done this for a really long time can probably know where they need to be, but, but I don't, I, there's times when I look over, I'm like, are we sure this is the right tempo? Because it feels <laughs> it really feels slow. wrong. It yeah. feels wrong. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. how, you know, it's right. And cause if, if I would have started that song in that moment without the click, we would have been going so fast and I would have felt would... like it was right. <laughs> you yep. know? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I generally, I certainly have played live with a click. I, I, I agree with all of the things that you're saying, uh, in, in both that it is super helpful and also that it is more fun uh, not to. But yeah. some, but like, th there's an asterisk on that more fun if it's not because if you do start the song too fast and you realize as soon as you hear your singer start choking <laughs> out lyrics or whatever, you're like, oh no. <laughs> and I have a rule: if people are dancing, I give myself two maybe four bars to make yes. significant tempo adjustments minor tempo adjustments sure you could do those throughout the tune if necessary talking, but what, like 10 10 bpm yeah, or more even like... more than five like <laughs> okay, more than yeah. five bpm is a that's a big that's shift a big right jump. yeah and so uh, you know doing that kind of jump if it's in the first few bars of a song i i i, I might be willing like depending on the song how important it is that we get it right like, like those kinds of things like sometimes it's like well this will just be a fast version of this today or this will be a slow version of this but some songs it's got to be you know yes. it's got to be in the right spot the groove goes away if you're not in the right spot you know correct yeah for some songs yeah for yeah sure. yeah for some it, exactly and, yeah and for others it's now a different groove oh, and, well. <laughs> and that can be okay but it depends on the song and so like i'll give myself those first few bars and after that it's just like no like Maybe I'll start to nudge it like each turnaround of yep. a chorus. I'll either speed it up or slow it down a as the song might need. But this is going to be a gradual thing. We're not going to make these, you know, gross changes. <laughs> There's nothing worse than being in a crowd hearing a band go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't like that at all. <laughs> no, I subbed with a band a couple of weeks ago and they had me count things in for the most part, which worked out fine. But again, it was like I've literally never played live with you. <laughs> I don't know where you guys feel these things. I know where the record is. They're like, oh, we play to the record. I'm like, okay, but that's a lie. Not because it's an intentional lie, but no cover, few yes. cover bands settle in on a tempo that's the same as the record, unless yes. you're using a click, right? Yeah, it, of you course, know, you, that's the only way. You find your own way of playing the song, and that's okay. In fact, that's what your fans are used to, so that's what you should do. And but there was one tune that the guitar player started it. I forget which tune it was, <laughs> but it was like super slow. And I look at the bass player and he's like, speed it up. And I'm like, OK, got it. And I I mean, we probably added, you know, 10, maybe 12 BPM like but to you. It. But you probably had the guitar player being like, what are you doing? Like, we're no, in the right spot. No, he okay, did he realize me. it? <laughs> yeah, he yeah, he realized it. He was like, Good. oh, shoot. Like, when I saw the panicked looks from every band member look back at me, it was like, okay, I know what to do now. And I set it to where I figured it should be. And everybody <laughs> was like, yes. That's form. <laughs> yeah, yes. But it was it's like. Hard, it is hard to increase or slow down tempo over a small or like a long period of time. That's a hard skill to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was this particular instance was a very short period of time. Let's go. It was just like, bam. Here it is now. And it was fine. Like, they were all, thank goodness. Okay. It was like, I don't know. I'm I, I'm supposed to act confident, but I'm the freaking sub. Like, you guys, <laughs> you hung me out to dry a little bit here. But that's fine, you know. Hey, real quick question. What did you yeah. think about all this modern uh, Braille country music that you were learning? Um, I, You know, it's it, it's interesting. I, I, I learned a long time ago that even if I wouldn't listen to something, I will find something about it that I enjoy playing. 
And so I came into these songs. I have a thing. In fact, this is great. I wanted to talk about like how we learn songs for our respective bands. So th- like this, this will, this will bring us into it. Um, Cause I want to ask you the same question too, but I, I have a thing where when I'm learning a song, I, the, fr- if it's a song I've never heard before, the first time I hear it, whatever comes to mind, whatever song it reminds me of, I write down on the chart so that I can be like, Oh, okay. You know, this is, this is like, there was, there was one song where it was like, Oh, this is like, uh, you know, this bowling for soup song. This was a country tune. Like, yeah, yeah. but it was, you know, it was like, well, that's what it reminds me of. And so that way, when I see it on the set list, I know, okay, this is this. And so a lot of these songs, and we talked about this last week with Adam, a lot of these songs are just straight ahead rock and roll or even power pop, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the tight harmonies and all that stuff. So, and I love power pop. So Mm -hmm. I like harmonies and and tight (laughs) harmonies, right. And all those things. And so, I, I liked most of the tunes that I learned and the country, you know, the modern country has a lot of those like 90s songs do those twists and turns where it's not just four, four all the way through. It's not, you're not sweet home Alabama in your way from the beginning into the end. Like you got to know, Oh wait, the, the third verse is halftime and then it stops and there's a vocal thing that happens a cappella, And then immediately you come back in with a big, huge chorus, double time or whatever, you know, it's like, you got to know this stuff. And and these are cool little tricks and effects like songwriting effects. I don't want to say like sound effects, but but they they're 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 tools in the toolbox of the songwriter or the arranger or the producer to make these songs like sink into people's psyches and minds and hearts. And so I mean they sunk into my psyche, mind and heart cuz I I listened to them over and over again and played them over and over again to learn them. So yeah. I, I, in the end, I like most of them. Yeah. And I fine. used to, I used to be the biggest hater of modern country. I, that was my hill You're not I alone. was dying on dude. And because yeah. I grew up, my parents grew up on, on, on old school country. And then even in the 90, like 90s country is totally different than what it is. And, and that's what I listened to when I was young. And then you got this guy that's never been on a farm singing about farms and like this fake accent you know they don't talk like that they they're just tuning it up for the show you know but yes of course but the more the more i dove into it i'll tell you what man modern country clearly affects people like it and i get it like you listen to some of these songs and it does something to your brain to be like oh you know what the simpler times man small towns i get you it it like it changes your psyche a bit and i'll tell you what i don't think there's any genre of music right now that sounds as good like the production quality of oh, modern country music it's amazing and yeah some of these songs like there was there's there was one tune about i forgot suds in the bucket right yeah. Uh, it, it's tune about the girl, you know, growing up and leaving home. And every time I played it, I had tears in my eyes because my daughter moved that, you know, I mean, like it's all good, but it's like, yeah, they know how to get into your head. Like they do yeah. this yeah. Like, more. I'm telling you, Morgan Wallens. I, I don't yeah. consider like Zach Bryan and Noah Khan. I don't consider that modern country. And those guys are absolutely blowing up. They're some of the biggest artists in the world, but Morgan Wallen, um, I I got his new album. I'm like, hey, let's see what all this is about. And it's one. It was my like top five album last year. And mm-hmm. there's a song called uh, uh, "98 Braves," where these songwriters are just incredible. He he associates like a, a fast romance that that didn't work out with the '98 Braves, who of course were one of the greatest baseball teams of all time, but didn't win the championship. And that was the same of this love that he had back in the day. They were they were the best love in the world, and then they didn't quite. That we both ended without a ring on our hand. You know, it's like oh, oh my god, like oh, it, it just it brilliant. kills me, man. And and the, the, I just think more people should give it a shot. And and I'll tell you what, I was I always try to think on my birthday of like one bit of wisdom that I can write down. And the thing I was thinking about today was that it it really makes me sad when people do not listen to new music. All right, folks, warmer, sunnier days are here. And you know what that means? More gigs and less time for cooking. Enter our sponsor, Factor. Factor's no prep, no mess meals have been my secret weapon lately. With a bunch of gigs and rehearsals over the past couple of weeks, 
Factor made it ridiculously easy to grab a healthy dinner before or after the gig, or, you know, sometimes both. Imagine this. You're rushing to a gig. You open the fridge, and bam, a chef-crafted, dietitian approved meal is ready in just two minutes. It's like having your own personal chef, minus, you know, the attitude. With 35 meals and over 60 add-ons every week, Factor keeps your taste buds entertained. From calorie smart to protein plus, they've got all the options to keep you rocking and rolling. Ever had filet mignon or blackened salmon after a rehearsal? Well, you can with Factor. It's like treating yourself to a restaurant meal without leaving your kitchen. And for those days when you're juggling gigs like a circus performer, Factor's ready in two minutes. No shopping, no prepping, no cleanup, just pure deliciousness. So whether you're keto, protein plus, or just love good food, Factor has got you covered. It's effortless support for your rock star lifestyle. So what are you waiting for? Head to factormeals.com slash giggab50 and use code giggab50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code giggab50, G-I-G-G-A-B-5-0 at factormeals.com slash giggab50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. And my thanks to Factor for sponsoring this episode. All right, so I I want to kind of dig into that conversation that we stumbled around yeah. uh, about learning. Like, how do you go about when you need to learn a new song for uh, Pork Tornadoes? Because that's the only band you play in now. Uh, I have a I have a side original project called Dope Walker, uh, where it's 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 it itches my original band uh, sure. fix of writing music called Dope Walker. That's good stuff. But yes. Fork Tornadoes is my, my in main terms gig. of learning cover, and and really, yes. I'm talking about learning yes. cover songs, yes. right? And it and I don't mean to dismiss original songs like no. I play in Bitter Pill. I love playing in Bitter Pill, but th- there's a technique. Uh, well, there's many techniques to learning cover songs, and they are it it behooves us all to share them with each other because the better we can get at it, the more efficient we can get at that, the better off we are. So I, I, I'll, I'm happily, I will happily share mine, but I, I want to start with you. Are you talking about me as a drummer or us as a band? Um, I would like both. Okay. Well, le- okay. So let's put it into the whole conversation of the, the band. We, we understand we don't ever practice. Let's just put it that way. I, I don't know okay. if that's a secret or not. We never actually get together and practice. Maybe once a year we will, we will do something, but we all live in different towns. That The idea of this model is that we don't have to spend the time doing that. Sure. Okay. And so, so we try to learn four, five, six new songs a year. And generally that starts with a text thread conversation of, oh, we should learn this song. And a lot of times it's got to have unanimous approval. It can't just be like one guy saying we're learning this. If, if everybody else says, no, nah, we're not doing it, but it usually has to go through the ringer of that. And then by the time it, it is decided that we are going to learn this song, usually what happens is we just stab, we establish who's going to be the lead. So all four of us can take lead on a song. Um, lead whoever vocal, that, you mean lead vocal. Correct. Got yes. It. Yep. Okay. So let's say it's, let's say it's Jerry. Jerry's going to learn this song. He will then start messing around with it. Say, this is the key. I want to do it in. He, he will learn it on his own, and then he will tell everyone, this song, this key, let's go. And then what I've been doing lately to help everybody is I've been then going on karaokeversions.com. I've been then downloading that, that karaoke version in that key, the full song, the drums, the vocals, the bass, everything. And then I'm sending it out to everyone with a click track saying, saying here's how we're going to play it. Okay. Everybody learn this version of it. And then when when everybody started putting their own uh, thoughts into it, learning it, we'll start running it in sound checks. Uh, we'll play it probably two, three, four sound checks, and then we will throw it into the show and just give it about two, three, four shows. See how see what people think about it. If they don't like it, we have enough enough songs to we're not going to force anything anymore. So yeah, that right. is generally that is generally the band's process of it. But me as a drummer. Um, Again, I'm self-taught, so I, I can't read any sort of sure. music or, or charts or anything like that. And the way and that I, I think I've that's learned... probably true of a lot of people who listen here. Like, uh, there's that, and that there's I, no. I, I'll say it. There's nothing wrong with with that. I've played with plenty of musicians who yeah. don't know how to read traditional sheet music. It's fine. Yeah. I love that about myself. I think that's where my style comes from and where where Fair. my where my sound comes from is just ah, I do it like this. And and so generally speaking, I will. 
I will give it about four, five, six listens in the car, just over and over and over and over. Start plotting it out in my head of like, okay, yeah, yeah. The, it, ver- I, I have that brain that goes, yeah, duh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, duh, two bridges, then two choruses in the stop here. Like I can tell myself that. Okay. And, and then I will go into the basement, put that on repeat, and just play along to it on my electronic kit. Um, and, and just implant it into my brain to where I know this song. Like I, I've heard so this you, song enough. Do you ever chart? Like, do you ever make a, a, like a written or a chart on your iPad or anything like that? No, I, I've got wow. this weird brain. Like I was telling you, yeah. I can go into the studio and you can, you can literally say, okay, click tracks going, go for it. And I can play the song without any reference track, without any notes. I, yeah. I know it. I know it enough in my head to be like, I don't know. I'm not hearing guitar or vocals or anything, but I know that it goes like this, 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 this. I just, I see it in my head, I guess. Let's put it that way. I, I certainly get to that point with songs. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I also wanted to talk about like subbing in a band versus playing in a pickup band because the prep for it's the same, but the product is different. Um, it, but uh, like a band that plays together, I think one of the signs that, or one of the things that makes a band good is when everyone on stage knows everyone else's parts. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's good for a lot of reasons. One, like you said, you you know, you play it and you're, you're hearing the other people play, even though they're not playing with you, but you also know, Oh wait, bass player just made a mistake. We need to figure this out in the moment. Right. Like those are, but I think that's a very important thing. Learning 40 songs in a week (laughs) for a, for a country gig or, or even like I've got a pickup gig at the end of this week, which is like somewhat classic rockish. So I've, I've, and I've played with one of the guys like a hundred years ago. So I, it, it's a little different, but learning 40, 40 songs, there was no world where I was going to have a sub gig in a classic rock band on Saturday night, at, which I needed to like all in prep for, uh, and then, you know, starting on the way home was when I started listening to the 40 songs that I needed for the country thing. There was no world where with everything else going on in my life that I was going to be able to just like wrote memory myself into (laughs) driving to the gig on Friday, thinking it was going to work. Right. You know, (laughs) so I do have a system. Yeah. And the first thing I do is ask the band, do you have your own library of chord sheets? Cool. Right. You know, because that's a great place for me to start. And if they don't, it's fine. I go to ultimate guitar and I pull down a PDF of the chords. Now, for me, I don't care if it's in the right key. I know enough about harmony that I can see, all right, this is, we're moving from the one to the five to the, to the six chord. And then, and then you've got this inverted thing or whatever. And so I can hear enough of that on stage to know, ah, this is where we are in the song if I get lost, right? But mainly I'm following lyrics for, yeah. for the most part. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's only solos where I'm looking at the chords and and like hearing the progression in my head. But I I grab the PDF, I put it on my iPad, but you could yep. you could do the same thing by printing it out. I just I, I would lose all those printouts and then the work oh, would yeah. have to be redone. And it's a windy outdoor gig. Like, what no. are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, or even just like six months from now, it's like, hey, you want to play with us again? Yeah, oh, crap. Oops, what did I do? I on that at the end of that show. Shoot. Exactly. <laughs> I, I burned it in effigy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe there's a moment where you'd want to burn yeah, the charts in effigy. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I have this shorthand that I've created where I basically... Um, because there's a lot of songs where you know drums stop and then drums come back in and that sort of thing, and again, all tied to the vocals. I I put like an L, uh, where the drums come in, and yeah. a backwards L where the drums cool. don't. Right, and and that's, so that's smart. Yep, I and I know it. I can look at it quickly and see it on stage. Now sometimes there's a figure that needs to be played, like a rhythmic figure. I do read music, and I count. You know, eighth notes is one and two and three and four, and I count sixteenth notes as one e and a two e and a three e and it right. Yeah. And and so when I hear the rhythm in the recording as I'm going through, it, I sit down with the recording and I mark up the chart uh, without drumsticks in my hand, not even at my drum stool. I just sit on my couch and do it. And when I come on a figure that come upon a figure that needs like to be that I need to play, um, I will I will write it down. Now, I I caught myself with this. With with these two sub gigs happening back to back recently, 
I it's e- I use a, an app called Fourscore, and it's easier in the app to write text than it is to write like staff notation because the staff notation I would just be doing with like my finger or something. I don't have an Apple pencil on my thing. Maybe I should actually, that sounds like a really good idea. Um, but I, so I'll, my temptation is to write out, like if, if the fill is that, 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 you know, that's one and two and a three and four. And I will write it with text, you know, one and two and a three and th- one plus Two E plus uh, yeah, yeah, three yeah. plus four plus, right? I'll write that out. And what I noticed at the gig that I played, the the sub gig that I did, you know, with the classic rock band, was that that was requiring a lot of in the moment translation for me because what was happening in my head is as I read that in my head, I was turning it into staff notation. Yeah, of course, and then playing it. And that was fine if I kind of knew it, but if it was something that was foreign to me, by the time I did the translation, it was too late. <laughs> that makes sense. Yes. But I learned this about myself. So I was like, okay, crap. And, and then when I sat down to play these country tunes, which I had started charting out the same way. And some of the figures, it was fine to leave that way, but other ones, it was like, no. And so I went back in and I just charted out the rhythms, uh, you know, in staff notation because I can sight read. And so... Like, that's fine for me to read, like, you know, with one beats notice, like, okay, here it is. Yep. Yep. Play it. Good to go. Unless it's something like super complex, but you know, these country songs don't have that. So it, it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an issue, but I, I changed a lot of charts halfway through last week, um, which all was for naught, obviously, because the it, it got rained out. I mean, I got paid for it and all that. Yeah, like, yeah. They, they took care of me and everything. It was fine, but still, it, you know, it was like. Oh well, I don't get I, do, I don't get to I don't get to road test this. <laughs> I do kind of miss it, you know, now that you're talking about it, you know, like I'll learn one song here and there and and even to your point about knowing each other's parts, we realized the other day that we all play the songs the same way, we all do the same little things that if I don't do that one exact fill coming out of this verse that it screws everyone else up. Like we had a moment where we realized that yeah. we're like that's that's kind of crazy, but but I miss that that kind of coming in and being the guy and and them being like yeah we had a guy last time and he just really didn't do his homework and and being the one that actually comes in and is like no no i can nail this like i i'm taking this seriously i i do kind of miss that i joke like you know i'm going through a bit of a a mental uh turn of uh, turn of thought process here but i always joke that like if the pork tornadoes end in a year like i don't know if i'm going to get back out there but but then then kind of talking about you stuff will. like that you're like I know you're like ah, but that would be kind of fun to just get together and just no pressure and just have fun out there so yeah I I could probably easily revert to the old days of just call me up I'm ready to go let's go yeah. my my yeah. drums are I, already in my car <laughs> they're ready to go that's it yeah no that that was that was the five months um between January and May for me it was yeah. that process it's like maybe I'm good with just playing in in just bitter pill even though we only play like you know three months of the year or whatever like. Maybe that's fine. I'll pick up a theater gig here and there yeah. to fill it in. And then I like I, I had a moment where I saw a path that was like, wait, what then happens if Bitter Pill like settles out? Like not not that we're heading in that direction, but what if it did? Now I have nothing. And uh-huh. now I'm Dave the theater drummer. And it was like, I I enjoy the theater gigs as a as a departure. You know, but it's I don't want to do that as yes. my thing. <laughs> and so it's like, OK, must fix this. And so, yeah, I've I've I, you know, that's why I wound up with with some of these gigs. I mean, some of them were already on the books, you know, that I had agreed to sub for. But others are like I've reached out to people and was like, no, let's 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 do this. And yeah. I have a pickup gig this. Uh, well, it'll be right before this episode comes out. And by pickup gig, what I mean is. It's a band that has never played as a band before. So the I've played with the bass player. It's a trio. I played with the bass player, you know, 15 years ago, and we, we played a lot together. The bass player and the guitar player have an acoustic duo that they do, like, actively now. I've never even met the guitar player. I won't meet him until I show yep. up at the gig. We have a text trail going. We've, put to, we've cobbled together a set list of songs that we all kind of uh, like know but there's some songs on the list that the guitar players never played before 
that you know the bass player and I've played. There's some songs on the list that I've never played before. The two, like the bass player is the the one that gets to stay home for this because he's the you know he's the glue that pulls it together. But the expectation going in isn't that we're putting a band on stage that is like a rehearsed and seasoned band with yeah. one sub member. It is it's a pickup gig. Like yeah. we've pulled our and and so. I'm treating it the same as I do anything else. Like I'm charting out the songs I don't know. But even as I say that, I know I'm lying. Like there's some of the songs where it's like, I I know that song well enough that I don't need a chart for it. Whereas if I was subbing with a band that was like a going concern and they had, you know, they had more at stake with it, with this gig, everybody's stakes are the same. <laughs> it's yeah. like, we're throwing this together and whatever. And we all want it to be good. And to me, that's the bar I'm trying to hit is I want it to be fun for me. Yes. So the more prepared I am, the less panicked I'll be in the moment and the more fun I'll have, you know. So that's that's kind of where that's but it's different. Right. The sub gig versus the pickup gig thing. I don't know. Yeah, and I do want to mention it to you. I want to see your thoughts on this. I, th- I think there are. I've been thinking about, again. I've been very uh, introspective and and reflective lately. And I I I've been thinking about the different kind of states of mind that people are at when they're doing cover music. Um, you know, like I think there's a couple different uh, reasons why. One is is the just. We're, we're, we joined this cover band with our buddies just to have some fun. Like we want to get out of the house. We want to, we, we just want to play music. Like who cares, man, if they give us 50 bucks, this is great. But we're just like away from the family and kids. It's our, it's our golf. You know, it's, it's yes, our golfing yeah. with buddies. I always just call it bowling night, you know, bowling right? night. Right. I yep. think that that is a, that is a, maybe the majority of, of people that do the cover band music. And I've been there. I've been in that world. Um, but then I think the the second world that I got into that I spent the majority of the pork tornadoes life in was this, um, le- I, ca- I call it like a legacy, right? Like, a like creating something that no one's ever done before and being the best and being the number one. And, and I've, I've, I've kind of been falling out of that a little bit. Um, and I, I don't know why, uh, but, but I was thinking back on like, why was I, why was I always like the pork tornadoes have to be the best band in the world? Sorry about that. The, why That's do right. why do the pork tornadoes have to be the best band and why do we have to have the most followers and why do we have to have the biggest shows and the biggest crowds and i think um i think thinking back i was always never it, whether it was like sports whether it was all the bands i was at in in in, in high school and college like I was never the best. I was never the best drummer. My band was never the best band. We would, uh, we were in this, ama- I had this incredible original band in college that, that we were so good, but we just weren't ever like, we weren't the next level. We, you know, we'd have all these yep. friends bands that are like, yeah, they're so good. And then they'd be like, yeah, you guys are pretty good. You know, like we, we, I sort of had this chip on my shoulder coming out yeah. of original band world to where like, I wanted to know what it was like to be the best and to, to take something to a level that has never been taken to. And I, I think I was pretty successful in, in doing it, but I also think that like, it's caused a lot of unnecessary like stress, uh, on, on my brain of like, well, man, if this post doesn't go well, like then, then people aren't going to know about us. And, and man, if this gig, if, if we don't really advertise this gig and blow it out of the water and spend money on advertising, then people are going to think we faded. Like we're, we're not on the hill and we're not going up anymore. And I've kind of realized it over the last year that like it, the comparison game is is pretty shitty in life of doing yep. that of of comparison is the thief of joy and when you're comparing comparing yourself to other things it's like it's never going to work out for you it's never going to give you people probably look at some of the stages I've played and shows I've played and people I've played in front of and been like ah man if I can just get to that level like I'll be good. It's I, and I'm here to tell you, you won't, um, cause then that becomes the norm. And then you're like, yep. well, we got to keep, we got to keep next? going. Yep. So I, I think I've entered my phase of musicianship where I've sort of entered that phase of the, just like, it's a job. Um, I want it to be fun, but I'm also here to collect a check, uh, because I've, I'm retrospectively getting paid for all the years of stress yes. and work that I've put in my life. So I don't know. I, I, I've been thinking quite a bit about trying to relieve that pressure, that mental pressure and stress of like trying to be the best. And, and I don't, I don't know if, if you've ever felt like yourself in all of those three different worlds, but I, it's something I've been thinking about quite a bit and I can't seem to shake it. Uh, yeah, you, well, you're not alone. I I've definitely been there. I find myself there routinely with it, with everything, bands, 
business, all of it. And, you know, to your point, comparison being the thief of joy, it's also the thief of progress. I I agree with you. It is the thief of your joy. And it's an unnecessary one. It is an unproductive thing. Comparing yourself to, you know, a competitor's band or a competitor's business almost always is irrelevant. And it's not the reason like them being better than you is not the reason you're not succeeding. You are your worst competitor always. And so figure out what you're doing to hold yourself back and, and work on that. Cause that actually you do get to control at some level. I mean, if you're in a band, it's like a collective, you know, thing that you got to do with other people, of course, but you know, don't like the comparison thing. I, I I find myself doing it routinely because I'm a human being and it seems to be sort of baked into who we are as people and that sucks, but whatever. Uh, but anytime I catch myself doing it, it's like, all right, great. I'm, I'll let myself compare whatever I'm doing to them as soon as I fix three problems that I can fix with my business cool. band, what, whatever, right? And then I sit down and it's like, oh, well... Actually, we can do this and this. And then suddenly at the end of it, instead of feeling like crap because I've been comparing myself to somebody else, I feel really good because it's like, wait, I just fixed or tweaked or improved three things here. I feel really good about this. And then suddenly I don't care about the other person or other band or other business anymore. It's like, oh, no, what we have is awesome. And it, so it that, but that's definitely a mind hack that I've learned in the yeah. past few years. It, I've been it, reading a couple of books. I've been uh, reading the subtle art of not giving a fuck. If you've ever read that book, it's, a, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. incredible. And I've actually been reading a little bit more into like stoicism. Cause like, I need, I need the, the words on the page to tell me things like, sure. I know, I know, I know this deep down, but like, tell me it on the page and let yep. me, let me look at it. Let me study it a little bit. And to think about that, that, that you'll no matter how high up you get in the world on in anything in business and band there's always going to be someone better than you like imagine but imagine better right now is- yeah but but imagine there is there is an artist out there let's let's just say like dua lipa who's just a gazillionaire has trillions of streams and millions of fans that is probably looking at taylor swift being like damn it I'm not good enough anymore. Like, look at Taylor Swift sell four nights in London, man. When when Dua Lipa could sell out one night in London at Wembley, yep. and it's like, that's awesome. That's Stop comparing yourself amazing. to Taylor right. Swift. You know, right. just worry about you. And I know. I, it's good advice. I will say, all that being said, as I have been in this mode of figuring out what to add to my schedule. Certainly, I've realized, well, I could just become the first call sub for lots of different bands. And and there's some fun in that. Like you said, you show up and you're prepared and, and you know, you they treat you like Superman at the end of the night because you saved their butts and you came in. You, they didn't have to babysit you through the gig. Like, you know, you did the things. That's awesome. But I like the vibe of being in a band and, you know, even leaving that sub gig the other night and, and they were, they're great guys. They are not playing at a level that I would want to be playing at, but that was also informative. It was like, you know, leaving the gig at two in the morning and there was you know, nobody there for the second half of the third set. And there were reasons for it. It was like, well, it's graduation weekend. It's the bike week. And so that happens well. over here. It's like, yeah, but there's always that. So, <laughs> yes, but even, is. but you know, there's always that. That even with that, like, you know, we pack, I stayed around and packed up with everybody as, as one does. And, and then it was like, oh, well, I guess I'll see you guys. Maybe never don't know, you know, what? and it wasn't like they were like, get out, but it <laughs> like, they have a, a drummer who had some surgery or whatever and he need, they needed a fill in guy. And so that was that, but like, they're not looking to replace him, yes. you, you know? And so it was like, gosh, I miss. Okay. So I, all right, two things. I want to be in a band. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I I, want to, I want to join and I want to join a cover band. I want to have my original band and a cover band. I figured this out, This is, which is great clarity for yeah. me. Yep. And I also don't want to be in just an average cover band. I, I don't want it to be bowling night. Yeah. I want it to be something more than that. And it doesn't need to compete with the pork tornadoes, but, but like th- a lot of what you guys do is geared towards making your band not bowling night, right? Yeah. So, like, there are a lot of things where I've thought, oh, yeah, look at what Mike's doing. Like, I don't know that I want to be 
flying all over the place to play gigs, like th- this, that, and the other thing. Like I got other things going on, but at, at, a, at, at my own version of it, if I could pick something perfect or find something perfect, that was that, but fit tailor made for my life and schedule. Like, that's what I want. I want people to know when they c- come see whichever, whatever band this is that I'm fictitiously making up in my head here. I want them to know that they're seeing a band that's here to perform from the beginning of the show to the end of the show and isn't just out because they enjoy the songs that they're playing. Right. In fact, the songs might not be about anyone on stage. The songs are about who they want to yeah. see in the crowd. And so I thought about your thing, uh, you know, where you say, what, what, what is your slogan or it's the unofficial slogan is that we play the songs your girlfriends love? Uh, we're your, we're girl, your girlfriend's favorite band, you know? Like we're your girlfriend's favorite band. There you yeah. go. Right. Like, to me, that, if you're going to bother to play covers, why not find a way to create a scenario where you're playing the covers that the people out there are going to love. And I don't necessarily mean just going and playing Mustang Sally and, and Sweet Home Alabama. Not that I have any trouble playing those songs, but I feel like a lot of bands play those songs and I'm not sure just playing Mustang Sally and Sweet Home Alabama is enough to make that happen. You've got to be in a band of people that want to perform whatever songs they're playing. Those songs, other songs, doesn't matter. And uh, so that's what that's what I'm looking for. I, you're right. I, and I, I don't mean that. And I'm, I'm willing like to take only... my time to find it. So, yeah, yeah, and you should. I don't mean that I'm only in it now at this point to just make money. I think that my my goal is to settle in to the middle of all of them. Is is to settle into this. I think that is the ideal band to be in. the The number one that that yeah, it is bowling night because these are like your best friends and you love yes. you love going to war with them and 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 being on stage with them is one of the greatest moments of your life. Yeah, the which, band which, vibe. Yes, right. which it is. Like I, these are. I'm the luckiest guy in the world to to play to have found the four dudes that I play with. Like I don't know how it happened and we would not be where we are without each other. But then yep. also like yeah, creating creating something and creating a legacy and and something that really does move people more than your average bar band is is a special thing and I don't want to get rid of that. But I also don't want to like make it my, the only thing I think about in my brain and yeah, I I want to I want to get paid and I want to get paid well for for the product we yeah. we we give. So like finding that like they're all there, they all exist in my brain but nothing's getting more more than yep. the other. That's where right now I'm like, woo, way high up there on the rest of the stuff. I need to just kind of go hope. Let's just find the middle ground. Be yeah. and I think that's what most people I think that's what you're explaining. Like that's what you want and I think that's what most musicians should want is to find that we're but you've got to well. be willing to yeah. put in the work. It's yeah, not God. like, right? Like if, if somebody's listening or watching here and says, okay, you know, I I, I just want to take Mike Schulte out of the pork tornadoes and replace him, but with no one else noticing so that we're all just this loving brotherhood of bandmates and we're all doing it. Even if that were to happen, you, whoever you are that's thinking that, would now need to do all the work that Mike does for the pork tornadoes. Which you, you don't, don't just know. get to right, but you don't get <laughs> you don't to just show up on stage and play the drums. You like you take care of all the socials. Like you, yeah. you guys are, have have divided the labor up, but you're all doing a ton for this band. And I would venture to say that any one of you in that band is doing more than the person doing the most in the average bar band out there. Yeah, it's and, it's it's essentially a full time job at this point, and right. the amount of work that we put in, and it's and it's not a full time band. If let's put it that way, <laughs> exactly. Well, and that's what I'm saying is like, and and I say this on Business Brain all the time. It, it, you know, uh, my one of my favorite quotes that I think I came up with is, "If you want your idea to be worth a hundred dollars, write it on a hundred dollar bill. Ideas <laughs> aren't worth anything without action." Yeah, and, that's great. And, You've got to take the action and you've got to be willing to just grind it out. And that is the fair when people I always say people bring me business ideas fairly regularly. You you have a little success or whatever. And people are like, oh, I want you to sprinkle your magic fairy dust. (laughs) Yeah. Dave's the guy. He he has magic fairy dust somewhere. He'll sprinkle it on my idea and it'll work. It's like, no, the magic fairy dust is grinding it out for five to ten years. Are you willing to do that? You know, do do you like to watch TV at night? Because if you do, the best thing I can tell you is stop watching TV at night. And now suddenly you have time to start a business. Yes. Is that what you want? I know you want what you think the end result is, 
But is that what you really want? And the same is true. It's no different for what you've done. So most people don't. They they'll ask me same with the podcast. That you you get a lot same of people coming podcast. at you going yeah. going. How do I? I, I've got this podcast. How do I get to where you're at? And then I go, I go, okay, well, check it out. Here's what we did that we know of. And it's, I list this like 12 item action plan of like, well, we did this, then we did this, then we did this. And they're like, oh, so it's not just like you pay money to like get your placement in the, okay, well then, yeah, that's not going to work for me. You know, most people will. Right. Mo and I think that's a good thing to think. If you are that person that wants to put in the work and that understands how much work's going to go into it. You're already you're already there because nine out of ten people will find out how much work work it takes and will say no. <laughs> I no can't thanks. do that. I can't I'm do stay that. Right where I am. Yes. Yes, and that's totally okay. I don't I don't mean to be judgmental about it, unless you're the person coming to me with an idea and you don't want to do the work. Then I will judge the crap out of you. Yes. <laughs> uh, but 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 other than that, it's totally fine. We and look. The amount of work I put into things, the amount of work you put into things pales in comparison to that which other people are willing to put in. Like we all choose our level. I liked the fact that I got to hang out with my kids while they were growing up. Yeah. My business absolutely suffered for that. Of absolutely course. suffered for it. But That's my family didn't through. suffer. Right. It, yeah. yeah. So what's more important? You can't do both. You, you know? get so, to pick. So figure right. out what your percentages are. And I'm I'm in that world right now. I was you wouldn't have believed how many like in the last decade, how many hours I've put into the band, the podcast, the my real estate job, just everything. I actually would believe it. But because yes. that's what I like to do. I I like <laughs> yes. to work. I I love creating things. But now it's like yeah, actually, I really love being at home. And I really mm -hmm. want to like go on a walk with my daughter instead of being like, I gotta and you want to be able to shot. go to her dance recitals yes. or her soccer games or whatever it is that she winds up, you know, path yes. taking in life. You want it and creating a scenario where you have the flexibility to do that. Amazing. Yeah. Like totally highly recommended. But there are sacrifices. Yes. You know, if you're at the soccer game or at the dance you're not, recital you're not somewhere else, <laughs> you're not somewhere else. Right. Your head is in it. Yeah. Do you have an extra like five minutes where I can talk about some gear? Yeah, for sure. Let's go. I am. Um, I have different things in my ears today, Mike. I'm not using my standard in-ears here. I am uh, testing out. We talked. I talked with Dan East recently about affordable in-ear monitors, yeah, yeah. right? And we talked a lot about universal fit in-ears and uh, because that's an affordable way to get started and it's a smart way to get started. And then literally, like right after we recorded it and right before it came out, Ultimate Ears announced their line of Ultimate Ears Pro, which has traditionally only been custom fit, uh, universal in ears, and so I've got a, I've got a set in my ears now. I actually have the two fifties. There are three versions of these. There's the two fifty, the three fifty, oh, and the one fifty, uh, and they are um, the the one fifty is I don't have the one fifties. The one fifty are single drivers. The uh, two fifty are dual drivers. And the 350, you guessed it, triple drivers. Uh, I have tested both the triples and the duals. It, they range from 199 for the singles up to 399 for the uh, triples. That's kind of, if you're comparing just drivers to dollars, that's expensive from a, a dollars to drivers standpoint, right? Because you can definitely get dual driver things in that, you know, certainly the 199, even the 150 range that are good and good quality. What's interesting about the Ultimate Ears, and it may or may not make a difference, is, uh, and I'm, I've got the 250s in my ears. They sound fine. They sound great. In fact, I've played my drums with them. I've podcast with them. I took these out of the box and put them in my ears two minutes before you and I synced up today. So I have not tweaked them. I wanted to get through an hour of them in my ears before I talked about their comfort because I need to be able to focus on the podcast and not be like, mm, my ears are screaming at me. Super comfortable. They on the outside, they kind of look like a uh, like a custom a, mold, like a custom mold, like a small like version a lot. of a yeah. custom mold. And then on the inside, it, they have a, a tip that is interchangeable for different sizes. The seal of these has been fantastic for the last hour. And so I, it would be fine. Uh, the interesting thing about these and what makes them different and what Ultimate Ears sort of pitch is behind them is the part that is not the, the the tip, the part that is not just the outside, but the the outer ear portion. 
they took all of the molds that they have on file and that they've seen over the years and determined some patterns from them. And so the shape of the part that is sort of fixed and molded is built based upon well, what m most people's ears are like. And like, like they added them all up and then divided them by that. And they're like, this is what it is. This is this the is universal is. mold. <laughs> this is the universal mold. Yeah. So to call them universal fits right. is correct. Only, but it's a shame we've used that term already I know it. <laughs> to, to describe the things that are just like little buds that you put in your ears. Like yeah. those don't have any molding to them. I mean, they do, but Kinda, not yeah. like this. These really sit in my ears. Uh, I think the the right one is, I feel it, it's sticking out a little bit. So I would probably put a smaller tip on that one. It feels fine, but as I'm putting my hand on it now, I can feel it sticking out a little bit. So I'd probably try a smaller tip, see if that still seals while being more flat uh, on my ear. But they they sound uh, they sound fantastic. I mean, it's going to be the same drivers that you would have in your custom fit. So yeah. it really is just about, you're getting the UE guts with... Uh, without paying for them to build you a bespoke custom mold, and if and when you start looking at it that way, well, these prices are are super affordable. Especially, yeah. um, I, again, I've tried the the three fifties, which are the triple drivers, and the two fifties, which are the single the dual drivers. I have not tried the single drivers yet because they are out of stock on them and didn't have them to send to me. But they will, and I'll circle back on that. But yeah, I mean, for two ninety nine, like this isn't terrible. Uh, you well, know, and pri price wise, yeah. To be to be sort of vain, because I I think maybe many people would think this way. Is I think the reason, obviously, a custom fit is great because it seals your ear better. But I think it also has a more professional look to it. The the idea of like, wow, look, it looks like the re like the real artist. Yeah. So the fact that this is is universal, but it it looks like a custom mold I, I that's the vein in me to say wow like that's I think that's an incentive to say wow it 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 does look professional, but yeah, it's just universal, you know. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I, I throw, I wanted to throw it out there and make sure people knew about this. And of course cool. we love gear and gear gab and all that stuff. So, but like I, the, the place where I am pickiest about sound is right where I'm sitting right now, because I mix this show live while we're doing it. And if I don't sound like me, <laughs> Then I'm thrown off for three weeks until I adapt to what the new me sounds like. Right. Yes. And there was a point in time right after we had Jerry Harvey on the show, he actually started the company Ultimate Ears, but but then he sold it. And Logitech is, the, you know, the sort of the parent of it now. Uh, Jerry went on to form JH Audio yep. and uh, he sent me a set of um uh, they're Layla's, which are these like 12 yeah. speaker <laughs> dynamic uh, um, uh, uh, like reference. I almost models. bought a pair of those, dude. I don't. I don't yeah, like I know. them. <laughs> I, know. I don't like them. I, I like other things that Jerry makes, but these reference ones, they're tuned weirdly. Yes. And they added too much bass. We did a bunch of episodes of Mac Geek Gab, and then I was on the road. And so I used these little, they don't make them anymore. They're called grain. Uh, they were just earbuds. They're made out of wood, and they have a really rich sound. They, they're great sounding things. It's a shame the company failed. They, this is like 15 years ago they failed. But it's what I have in my in my bag. And I also just bring like a regular USB microphone. I don't use like the whole setup that I have here in the studio. So I plugged it all in, recorded the show. And I had like 50 people write in and they were like, oh my God, your sound was so much better. And like, one what? guy, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm like, what? I did, did, but no, that's not. And then I listen and I'm like, oh my God, he's right. But one guy said it really well. He says, it's like the difference between FM and AM. Whoa. And I was like, wait. I've been listening on these reference things. I have tuned out all the low end because these things are adding too much back of in. Of course, of course. Of course. And so I went back to like my, uh, the original ones that he made for me, which were the UE five C's or whatever. And, uh, for the studio here. And those were like, Oh, it was like, okay, now I, I can get the sound the way I want it and sound like me. The fact that I have almost forgotten that I am using these a says that they're super comfortable yeah. and B says that they sound like me, which is again, not a surprise because everybody uses the same armatures or, you know, there's a, there's a, there's like two or maybe three companies that make the armatures that are used yeah. in all the in-ears and they're all basically the same. The crossover is where it matters. Like, so yeah. did they set the crossover at the right spot? 
for me, yes. And cool. uh, you know, so yeah. Anyway, there you go. Nice. So, yeah, yeah. Good for people to know. Good for people to know. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, tell people please where they can find you. Yeah, you know, I know that you're listening to this podcast, so you want more podcasts. So check out Confused Breakfast. It's 80s, 90s, 2000s movies. We just did Crocodile Dundee. We got Independence Day coming up here for the Independence Day, obviously. And I'm in a band called The Pork Tornadoes. Search us anywhere. Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, all that fun stuff. That's where you can find me. Sweet. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Make sure you go to giggabpodcast.com. Join our mailing list because that way you know when Mike's been on the show and we can like carve some things. You can either choose not to listen or choose to listen. That's your choice. Mike, you got three words for us before we uh, say goodbye? Hey, always be performing, okay? That's good advice. <laughs>